Bedlam lives up to the name. A lot of contenders survive in advance, and we turn the calendar November and turn up the heat in the college football playoff race. All that and more right here on The Three Technique. One man. Goodbye. Hello, Heisman. 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 45. There goes Davis. Oh, my God. Davis is going to oh. run it all the way back. Auburn's going to win the football game. Welcome in to the Week 10 Recap Show right here on the 3 Technique. Trey Reeves joined by Mr. Garrett Turney over on the other side of a beautiful Metroplex, albeit we're a little upset that the sun is going down a little bit earlier over here. I love the extra hour sleep. I hate this part of fall when we lose all the extra daylight. Garrett, other than the uh, early onset seasonal depression from the darkness, how are we doing? Well, we're doing pretty good over here at 3 Tech HQ. We're celebrating a couple of rings this week. Yes, we uh, are. First ring we got to celebrate these World Series champion Texas Rangers right in your eye hole, all of our fans from Houston. Um, <laughs> no, it's it's super exciting, obviously, to be able to get your own championship um, and to do it the right way the first time and to, you know, earn it. Um, and, you know, I'm just really excited about this. Obviously, this is a team that we've all followed for a very long time. And so, you know, for us, it was kind of a dream come true to be able to celebrate this. But the second ring that we're celebrating, Trey, I don't know if you want to let the people in on this one. I will. Absolutely. And yes, the, the Rangers ring is fantastic. This one is even more exciting, though, I think, to us here at the Three mm -hmm. Technique. If you're noticing, Mitch is not here with us. He is celebrating an engagement. He got yeah. engaged on Saturday. He, uh, his lovely fiance, engaged, ready to be married sometime next year. And we couldn't be more than excited for him. We regrettably gave him the day off. We, we said, I guess we can give you this one day off. But um, he's celebrating with family still as we're recording this Sunday night. That's the reason we uh, did not have a live show Saturday as well. We were celebrating with the Mason family and his fiance. And we just couldn't be happier for you, Mitch. Uh, I know you're going to be listening to this when it gets published, but so happy. Congratulations to you too. And just reach out to him on Twitter at Mitch Mason uh, 10 to send him well wishes. And uh, from all of us at the three tech as well, we wish you nothing but the best. So Garrett, a lot of excitement off the field for us yesterday, tons of excitement on the field. Before we get too far, I do want to remind you that this show and every show is brought to you by the Transfer Portal CFB. We're writing a uh, headlines and review article each and every week, but there are a ton of articles, ton of college football coverage, more than most mere mortals can handle over on this Transfer Portal CFB. Make sure you're checking that out, following along on Twitter, and uh, checking out the website as well for all of the good stuff that's coming out over there. And we're also brought to you by our friends at Home Field Apparel. As the weather's turning, it's time for a new wardrobe, man. And it's time for the hoodies. It's time for the bomber jackets. It's time for those sweet, sweet retro logos and comfortable designs from Home Field Apparel. You can use our code 3TECHPOD at checkout for your first order for 15% off. And click the link in our Twitter bio if you're a return customer to get that 15% off as well. Tons of styles, tons of teams all the fun retro logos that we all love. And again, use code 3TECHPOD at checkout to make sure you get your 15% discount. Garrett, you know, I love doing our Saturday live shows and it's quickly becoming one of my favorite things that we do here on this podcast. But this week, not only for celebration, but also from a new standpoint, it was really good that we kicked our recap show to Sunday because we actually had some pretty big news break out on the West Coast today. Um, Alex Grinch, the much maligned defensive coordinator out at Southern Cal, is out. He is no longer employed by the Trojans. He has been fired, relieved of his duties, and I think for good cause. I think anybody that's been paying attention out there, not just this year, but last year, has really been able to see that 
his defenses are holding that program back. The offense is championship caliber. They're led by, obviously, the far and away favorite to go number one overall in next year's NFL draft, Caleb Williams. You saw the emotion on Caleb Williams' face last night when he put it all on the field. He did everything he possibly could to lead the Trojans to an upset of the fifth-ranked Huskies, but the defense just couldn't stop a nosebleed, and that's what it's been the entire two years that he's been under control and dating back to his time at Oklahoma, quite frankly. I don't know why Lincoln Riley thought that he was the guy that he needed to bring out there with him, but here we are, right? Here we are two years into the tenure, not even two years in. Alex Grinch is done, and it's for good reason, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously you could talk about wasting the potential of Caleb Williams, but, you know, he doesn't obviously coach him directly. Who he does coach is, you know, guys like Bear Alexander and Mason Cobb, who's been a little nicked up. You can't, you know, blame him for, you know, not maybe performing at his standard right now. But the point is, he's got great talent. They've brought in really great talent over the last several years, you know, through the the transfer portal, especially this last year, having all the hype train from Caleb Williams, winning the Heisman and, you know, having the great season they had last year. You turn that around and you say, well, all of a sudden better players should translate to better results. But look, there's some kind of fluky things with the turnovers and the opportunistic defense last year that just kind of haven't turned back around this year. Um, and, you know, that's going to end up costing you. But especially when you have better talent, you have to find a way to put a better defensive product on the field. Scoring 42 against the top five team should do it, right? If you can score 42 against the top five team, you should be able to win most of those games. Washington put up 52 because your defense is trash. And that's not anything on the players. I can't believe that the players are that bad. Right. These are all, you know, D1 athletes. These are all, you know, big time recruits. I just kind of think at the end of the day, you have to put this one squarely on Alex Grinch. And kind of like what you said, Lincoln Riley, you're the guy who brought him, you know, across. You're the one who kept him last year, even after a bad product. This falls on Lincoln Riley to make a better product and to put a better product on the field as he's the leader of this program. So, look, is it unfortunate that you're probably wasting the Caleb Williams years with just a trash defense? Yeah. But there's still hope for this Trojan program if they can turn it around you know, on the defensive side of the ball, keep some of that talent coming in. They can put a good quarterback on the field. They can have a great offensive system, right? Just because Baker left didn't mean that, you know, there wasn't Kyler or whoever else to keep running the offense for Oklahoma. So Lincoln Riley can put a good product on the field. It's just up to him to actually do it and to put a good defensive product out there to pair with it. Yeah, I, I, well said. I don't want to, you know, beat the dead horse of his defense, but I will just show you from, you know, the numbers don't lie, right? The scoring numbers don't lie. In the losses that USC has had, there have been six now in the two years under Lincoln Riley. They've given up 43, 47, 46, um, 48, 34 to Utah this year, which I think that's the equivalent of giving up to 40 to most other teams. And 52. So it's not the offense. They're, they're what, scoring. They're, what were ahead. the offensive outputs in those games? Yeah. So dating back to last year, uh, the, it was a 43 to 42 loss to Utah, a 47 24 loss to Utah. I think Caleb Williams got banged up. Yeah, that was, his, yeah, that was, about, oh, yeah, that was, yeah. 46 45 to Tulane in the Cotton Bowl in a game that they just, you know, collapsed defensively in the second half. Uh, 48 20, it was a butt whooping to Notre Dame, 34 yeah. 32 to Utah, and 52 42 last night. So, so, outside of two games, your offense showed up big time. Yeah. And, you know, the, the two games where they didn't, one was the championship game where, you know, you just kind of got beat soundly, and the other one was a bad weather game against Notre Dame. Yeah. That, I mean, that's exactly right. And USC fans will be the first ones to tell you that the defense is what's holding this program back right now. The long term, it might be the recruiting because I don't know if you've looked at the recruiting rankings lately. Yeah. Lincoln Riley is not exactly cleaning up there either. But for right now, well, we'll use funny one too. I don't know if you saw it. They had a big time DB commit like immediately after Grinch got fired. So it seemed like maybe somebody was just waiting for a, a certain shoe to drop before he felt good about committing to that program. <laughs> Correlation, not always causation, but I think that's maybe a not. Maybe good not. hypothesis right there. <laughs> um, again, Alex Grinch out as the USC defensive coordinator. I, yeah, I think anyone saw this. Everyone saw this coming. We don't always see coordinators get ousted in the middle of the year, but you know, if they're going to salvage anything, they're still in it for the Pac-12 title. 
right? And that does mean something, being the last team to win the Pac-12 before they ride off into the sunset to uh, the Big Ten does mean something. And if they're going to do that, they're going to need a renewed defensive effort as they finish the season at Oregon and home against UCLA. Garrett, let's transition to some other teams because we want to kick off tonight after our news uh, breaking just talking about our new power rankings. And we're going to do this kind of rapid fire. We're going to go back and forth, pick our top 25. Um, we'll have a graphic out uh, for those that can't exactly follow along. But um, Garrett, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to let you pick the first team. We're going to go back and forth, one through 25. Who are you putting in the number one spot after week 10? Oh, boy, oh, boy. I finally get my chance at this. The best team in the Dude. nation right now are the Michigan Wolverines. That's the best All team right, right now. They, they, they've they looked good all year. I know they got their little cheating scandal. That's a whole separate thing. But right now it's the Michigan Wolverines. I, you know, I think Michigan and my team, I'm going to put Georgia number two. Yeah. Um, disagreeing with the college football playoff. We talked about why we're doing that on our preview show this week. And I think the Buckeyes showed us on the field this week why we might be have a little bit of cause for pause. We'll talk about them in due time. Definitely but true. Michigan and Georgia, I don't think you can fault anybody for putting – whatever order you want to put there. Yeah. right? They and and for me, I thought that Michigan was by and large the best team, but now I'm putting the gap a lot smaller. I think Georgia's really made up some ground the last couple of weeks, especially with what Carson Beck's doing. Yeah. And again, we'll talk about both of these teams in due time today. So we don't want to, you know, completely hash out all this, but I, I don't think you can go really wrong with either. I'll put Georgia number two back to you for number three. Number three, the Florida state Seminoles. They just keep winning. They've got a great resume so far. Can't knock them. Yeah, I agree. I still have them in my top spot as well. This is where I'll put in Ohio State. I do think, you know, regardless of how it's been done, it hasn't been pretty at times. It's definitely not as pretty as we're used to with the Buckeyes, but the defensive prowess is still definitely there. And they have two of the best wins in the country in Penn State and Notre Dame. That Notre Dame win is looking less and less valuable by the day, but uh, still the true. best wins in the country. I think you can't keep them out of the top four. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, for number five, this is where it's, I don't know, maybe going to get a little bit controversial. And again, I think you can flip flop these teams, but right now, total body of work, even given the head to head, I'm going to put Oregon number five. I think Oregon's the better team right now. Stomped all over California, a team that took USC to the brink. Um, yeah. And that's, again, no excuse necessarily for USC. Um, the, maybe a Grinchless USC is better there. But I think Oregon's the better team at the moment. And I think that I'd be very excited to see what that looks like in a, in a head-to-head in Vegas. I'll, yeah, I'll follow up with Washington. Definitely the class of the Pac. Those two are definitely the class of the Pac-12. Their offense finally got clicking again this week against the Trojans when they absolutely had to. And, you know, I think any defense is going to struggle. I think you'll see Oregon's defense struggle against USC this week, too. So not too worried about that there. But you're right. The rematch is coming. It's going to be fascinating. I'm really interested to see where you go next, because I think there's going to be a lot of debate. There's going to be, you know, the head to head argument versus the improvement over the course of the season argument. If I if we're going where I think you're probably going to go here. But we are going where you think I'm probably going here. The team that has improved and looks the best right now. Again, I just threw out head to head for Oregon, Washington, and I'm throwing it out in Tuscaloosa. Give me the Alabama Crimson Tide at number seven. This is the first week I thought Milrow looked really, really good. Not necessarily as a passer, but you know, he did a lot of stuff to make his team win. So go Alabama on this one. There used to be a big gap below number six. And again, the gap is slowly narrowing as the season finishes out. People need to prepare themselves for Alabama to be in the college football playoff. I'm, I'm just saying that right now on November 5th. I, I think people need to prepare themselves that Alabama could win this whole dang thing again just because. They, they can. They absolutely can. And we had written them off in September when they lost to our next team, number, I think we're eight now, Texas. And, guys, it's okay. You can throw out the head-to-head. That was September. That was week two it's okay to use the eyeball test and see, talk about what we, they have identical records. They have, you know, if you want to compare losses, Alabama has the better loss quote unquote to Texas than Texas does to Oklahoma right now. And it's okay to use the eyeball test. We're in November. That was way back yep. in week two teams are allowed to improve. And right now, Alabama is playing better than Texas. Yes. I know Texas has a backup quarterback. Yes. I know they have their own issues, but 
you know, we were wondering if Alabama had a quarterback in September yeah. when they lost to Texas. And now we definitely know they For a didn't. little bit, they didn't. For a little it bit, they sure didn't. It sure looks like they do now. And now it looks like they finally figured out how they can win and win big with Jalen Milrow. So I'm, I'm team put Alabama above Texas, throw out the head-to-head in September and, you know, let it play out how it is. Where do you go after those two? I'm going to stay chalked with what the AP has. I'm going Penn State at number nine. I just think this is a really good team. Um, I don't think that it's one of the best teams in the country, as maybe their head coach does, but I do think this is a really good team and a deserving top 10 team until they show us something else. Stomped all over my turtles uh, and stomped all over my heart, so I'm going to go with Penn State. Not a bad pick. Um, I'm going to go Ole Miss here in the next spot. Uh, Listen, they they beat A&M. I know it was only a three-point game, but they dominated that game at times. A very talented Texas A&M team that really doesn't know how to win on the road, but Ole Miss took care of business. They only have one loss to Alabama, so you got to keep them somewhere up there near the top ten. I, I regrettably put Lane Kiffin in my top ten. <laughs> and I know it hurts you. Um, I, I might you know go a little homer pick here, uh, but at number 11, I'd put the Utah Utes. I think the Utah Utes are a really solid defense. They they play really, really well on the defensive side of the football, and they've proven that they can score uh, when it matters, right? Look, you can say for what it is, it was USC's defense, but they did put up some points and win that game against USC, and it seemed like they exercised some demons. They beat Arizona State 55-3, to and I know that Arizona State is, you know, nothing. But, look, they beat the crap out of them, so I'm going to go ahead and take Utah at number 11 over what anybody else did. I'm going to put the last power five team with just one loss in here next Louisville. Mm -hmm. Look, I know, you know, we, we catapulted the, everybody catapulted them up their rankings after they beat Notre Dame. And like I said, with USC earlier or uh, Ohio state earlier, that Notre Dame win isn't is losing some luster week by week, but Louisville looks good, man. They look talented. They're winning games and they might just force gump their way to 11 and one, just kind of find themselves in the right place at the right time. (laughs) Uh, and find themselves in the ACC championship game. So 11-1 Louisville could happen, and I would not be surprised at this point. Yeah, man. Uh, Unlucky number 13 here. Uh, I'm going to go Oregon State. Uh, I think Oregon State's still a really good football team. Didn't really impress me against Colorado, but, you know, you can say road game, whatever you want to say. But, look, at the end of the day, it's still a really good football team. Still a team capable of winning a lot of games, and so I'm going to stick with them at uh, number 13. I'm going Missouri next. I don't want to fault them to and drop them too far for losing to who I think is the number one team in the country in Georgia. And they played them really tough this week, tougher than anyone has played Georgia short of other than Auburn, tougher than anybody that's played Georgia this year. So I'm going to keep, I'm going to give Missouri some respect, shout them out for still being seven and two. And I'm going to keep them right here. Yeah, and if you really watch that game, I think Missouri played better than Auburn did, even though the score maybe wouldn't indicate the so. The first game win expectancy for Missouri in that game was 57%. We'll talk wow. more about that game, but yeah, they, yeah. they deserve to. They look good. Numbers. They look good. Yeah. Uh, number 15, give me the pokes. Oklahoma State, huge win over the rival. They're looking good, man. They're looking real good. They didn't need the run as much as they needed. We'll talk about that in a second, but um, yeah, big win for the pokes. They're riding high. I put them at 15. I'll take Tennessee next. Uh, big win over UConn this week. They keep looking good at times. They, you know, there are times when they look like maybe the best team in the SEC when they raced out to that 17 to nothing lead against Alabama. And there's other times where they look really beatable. But for right now, I'll keep Tennessee here. Yep. Um, 17 LSU. They lost to Bama. I'm not going to knock them for that. They didn't look super, super competitive, but that offense is still really, really good. Obviously, there's some problems on the defense for LSU, but um, for now, they're still a, a really good football team, and you can't knock them for losing to Bama on the road. Um, you know, I'll go with the head-to-head matchup now because I think the next two are in the Big 12. If I think I know where you're going next. Uh, I'll take Kansas, uh, head-to-head win over Oklahoma. Um, I'm not going to put words in your mouth and assume you're picking Oklahoma next, but – uh, I'll take Kansas here. I really love what they're doing on offense. They had a tough game against Iowa State. They came out on top, weren't favored in that game. They still won on the road. All right. Now, at number 19, I know what you said, but hear me out. Okay. In your heart, if they played on a neutral field, are you picking 
Oklahoma are you picking Tulane? Because I I don't know. I feel like that game could be that, that game could be a little dicey for the Sooners. It definitely could. I'm still picking Oklahoma heads up. I think they're the better team. All right. Then they can it, be it, number 19. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I, I, Tulane's going to be number 20. I sure it would be a fantastic game. I would love to see that. A rematch of last year. Uh, they, they almost beat the Sooners last year, right? Am I misremembering that? Or did I think yeah, right about that. it may ago. not have been as close as, you know, really, really close to beating them, but I think they played them competitively. I'll check that score real quick. I think it was two years ago. They played a really close game before Tulane kind of broke out, but. Yeah, I, I think it'd be a fun game to watch. Oklahoma would probably be favored by about six and a half points, so I'll roll with them. I know we don't make our uh, our power rankings based on Vegas spreads, hypothetical Vegas spreads like some, but um, right. I still would pick Oklahoma in that game straight up. Um, after Tulane, I got to go James Madison, 9-0, and and look really, really good doing it. At some point, we got to give them respect, right? At some point, I know that they've said, you know, they can't be in the college football playoff rankings for whatever reason. I still I don't understand that rationale at all. Um, but I'm, they're going to be in our rankings here. Twenty one, James Madison. Yeah, and I love the graphics that keep getting made about should be bowl eligible and all that. It's kind of fun. Um, I, I think don't I know just stole your pick though. <laughs> no, it's okay. We're good. Twenty two though. I'll tell you what. Twenty two Notre Dame is normally the pick here. Uh, I'm going to Arizona. I think Arizona is the better team right now. Arizona is playing really, really good football. I actually debated throwing them a little bit higher. Uh, Might have put them up there for that Oklahoma pick at 19. But ultimately, I think Arizona is a really good football team who's kind of figuring out what they need to do. This last little stretch for them is going to be really fun towards the end of the season, see if they can't upset a little bit and, and finish a really, really strong campaign. Nine and three is on the table. It absolutely is on the table. And again, who's going to win more games? USC or Arizona? That is still very much in doubt. It's as we starting know. to look like the Wildcats. It's starting <laughs> to look like the Wildcats, isn't it? Um, sure is. So I'll go Notre Dame next. You know what? No, I'm not. No, Notre Dame does not deserve to be ranked over a couple more teams that we're going to talk about here. I'm going to go Liberty. Liberty's undefeated. Put the flames, give put some respect on the flames names. I don't care who they play. If you're nine and zero, you get to be in the power ranking. Liberty, yeah, for sure. Come on, Liberty, that's fun. All right, uh, so what? That gives us two more, or one more? I think it's two more, right? I think two more. Yeah. All right, two more. I'm looking at the list. Mm, I think I'm okay with North Carolina being here. I think I'm okay with UNC at 24. Um, I think that's a good spot for them. Look, they're seven and two. They're a really good squad. They, they don't really have a, like a signature moment, right? They've had some kind of embarrassing losses. So while I'm not convinced that they're going to be like that top tier right now, it's still a good team. That's won a lot of football games. I'm looking at the receiving votes and it's just silly. Who is down here at the Texas A&M is getting an AP poll. Vote. That's ridiculous. Um, I love how Clemson got one too. They're like, see, <laughs> Five and four Clemson, number 25. Congratulations. Sure. All What's right. Uh, not in our poll, though. I'm going to go. This, this is so. Who do I want to give some love to? Because this is really. It's really about just like who gets to be on the graphic at this give point. Give him the G5 love. Come on. Toledo. There we Toledo go. Toledo gets to Toledo. be on the graphic. Yes. Eight and one. Five Correct. and oh in the MAC. Gave, uh, I can't remember who they played in the non conference, but gave their non conference opponent just all they could handle. Toledo Rockets, number 25. Garrett, thanks for going through that exercise with me. I don't know oh, if yeah. that'll be a full new segment on the pod. Let us know what you thought about that, uh, listening to that live radio. But I, I thought it was fun, so maybe we'll continue that one. I had a good time, and if all y'all hated it, just click off. Yeah, you can skip, <laughs> skip forward. Uh, don't tell your sponsors you did that, but skip forward. Well, Garrett, let's go ahead and get to the games because that's what the people came here to hear. And we're going to start with our top game of the week that we highlighted, Bedlam. The last Bedlam on the schedule. And Oklahoma State, little brother, quote unquote, knocks off the big brother Sooners, sends them off packing to the SEC with a 27-24L. It's poetic, isn't it? Like, we talked about on the preview show how, and you and I talked face-to-face yesterday about how you know, the whole universe just seemed to be pointing towards Oklahoma State. And sometimes we thought about, you know, you got to kind of lean against that sometimes when everything seems to be pointing in one direction. You got to zig when the universe is telling you to zag. 
but it all worked out for Oklahoma State. They've quite frankly were just the better team today. They matched Oklahoma punch for punch. They controlled this game. It was in their hands what was going to happen on the field. They had, you know, two thirds of the time of possession practically. Um, just as many pass yards, just as many rush yards, forced three takeaways, got 10 points off those takeaways. Electric scene in Stillwater. And I just can't help but feel amazing for the Cowboys and their fans. I ran into somebody in Dallas that was repping their orange and black today and just had a great conversation about with them. Uh, with them about just how great they were feeling after that win. What were your takeaways from this game? Because Oklahoma State obviously fired up. Ollie Gordon did his thing. Alan Bowman looked really, really good as well. Are they a true Big 12 title contender in your mind? And did they cement themselves as that after this win? Oh, absolutely. I mean, they're in the race of it because anytime you have a player of the caliber of Ollie Gordon, you're going to be in that conversation, right? Ollie Gordon, the funny thing is, he didn't have his best game. It, it seemed like he wasn't nearly as dynamic as he normally is. And then I look at the score sheet and, oh, look at that. He's got 138 on the ground. He's got 138. They because they tried he did to throw a pass yeah. and it just got uh, completely blown up. And, and look, I, I've talked long about how, you know, Ollie Gordon, prior to Trinity High School, he did pretty much everything for the Trojans. He, I don't remember him throwing too many passes in his time in the in the black and red. So I don't think anybody um, throws very many passes. In the black and red. Nobody does. Well, and especially that's ah, a whole other conversation. But um, <laughs> lost the rivalry game. It's fine. Um, but no, man, it's it's exciting times for Oklahoma State, right? You have a player like Ollie Gordon. You're going to have a chance to do this whole thing. But let's go ahead and give a shout out to Alan Bowman for keeping up with Dylan Gabriel. He, he wasn't as good, right? I, I don't think he was you know, overall is good, but he made some clutch throws. Um, he was just 10 yards behind him through the air. Didn't throw a touchdown, but didn't throw a pick. Um, and, and so he kept up and gave his team a chance to win with that. And when you throw in the three turnovers that Oklahoma had and and just the the poor performance overall they had when it came to taking care of the football, th this was just a magic scene in Stillwater, right? This is just all that it comes down to. The Disney movie writes itself, right? At a certain yep. point, you can't mess with the mojo like that. And, and, you know, I think the thing that's really awesome, too, is just what this means for both teams. Oklahoma State has permanent scoreboard, right? They can just take their scoreboard forever now. And, and by the way, had all of the bragging rights ready to go. They they played should have been a cowboy, which I thought was amazing on the field. Um, and then as people are leaving, they played we are never getting back together. Uh, you know, <laughs> leaning into the eras tour. So, you know, uh, I'm excited for them that, you know, Oklahoma State is in their victory era, so to speak. Um, and look, I'm excited to see where they can go from here because, you know, when you look at the rest of the season, you've got to think they're one of the inside favorites to make it, maybe possibly to win the Big 12. Well, they would be in the title game if the season ended today. And their last three games are against three of the newcomers that have yet to beat um, a non newcomer to the big 12. Now the, the combined three teams, I think it's uh BYU Cincinnati and you uh, Houston, I think are their final three and Houston is the only one they got finally got their first win this weekend against Baylor. So it's an inside track. You're absolutely right. It, the schedule makers did them some favors with this stretch run down the stretch. And so, yeah, at they, UCF they, and at Houston, then BYU at home to end the season. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah, UCF has not beaten a non-newcomer. BYU has not beaten a non-newcomer. Houston just got their first win. So Barely. Over Baylor and barely. over. And it's because they went for two in overtime. Uh, <laughs> almost gave that game away in Waco. But, listen, they have an inside track, and I think we're going to look back, unfortunately. I, I don't want to, you know, make Cowboy fans sad because you should be celebrating right now. But, holy cow, if they can win out, if they can beat Texas – in Arlington or whoever they play in Arlington, that South Alabama loss. We are going to be circling that one for a long, long time. And it could have kept Oklahoma state out of the playoff, right? If they're able to run the table here, but we're not going to focus on that. We're going to, you know, celebrate with the Cowboys and celebrate their potential big 12 title birth on the way. Still three wins that they got to check off, but they should be heavily favored in all three of those games. Well, and I, I want to say real quick, this is just the perfect example of Mike Gundy being Mike Gundy, 
right? It, it's it's the finding a way for your team to just win a game that you probably have no business winning when you just look at the players and the and the and the papers and the analytics and everything else. Really, Oklahoma State shouldn't win this game, but they did, and they found a way to do it because Gundy is Gundy, and, and also the the season as a whole is such a Gundy season, right? It's you know oh, yeah. drop the South Alabama game at home and and then drop the close one to Iowa State on the road. And then just rattle off a bunch of wins and put yourself right back at a chance to get in the championship game. It's exciting times for Oklahoma State, but man, this is just the Mike Gundy special if there ever was one. Absolutely. Let's go across the Red River because, you know, you talk about two teams headed in different directions. Oklahoma State is definitely trending up. Texas is holding steady. Texas is taking on water, but Texas is surviving and they survived. To, uh, yesterday against the 23rd ranked Kansas State Wildcats, 33-30 in overtime in a game that had no business going to overtime. It was 27-7 to with four minutes left in the third quarter, and then it was all Wildcats to end regulation, and they storm back, tie the game at 30. Kansas State missed a 27-yard field goal with a chance to uh, tie the game late. They had to come back, get another stop, come back and kick the eventual game tying field goal. And they were a fourth down stop away from stealing this one in Austin. They were all the way down at the goal line, decided to go for it on fourth and goal in overtime, steal the win. They come up short, their play is blown up. But a couple of things, big takeaways for me, Garrett. Texas did a fantastic job of taking control of this game early. We saw them do that against Houston a couple weeks ago. But this is now a trend with the Longhorns where they take control of a game and one or two things go wrong and it just spirals on them and it lets the team that they have cornered slowly but surely come back into the game. It happened against Houston. It happened uh, didn't happen against BYU last week because BYU was just overmatched, but definitely happened against Kansas State this week. Malik Murphy in the first half, Malik Murphy in the second half looked like two completely different people. In the first half, all the takes – of this week where, Oh, they're not, they're too scared to unleash him. They have a shortened playbook, yada, yada, yada. That looked like fool's play um, with, with his play on the field. He had a connection with Adonai Mitchell in the first half. He was slinging it all over the yard. He looked like he had full control of the playbook. And then the second half happened. And after they went up 27 to seven, it was ugly for the Longhorns offensively. Kansas state had no business coming back in this game, but there they were with a chance to steal it on fourth and goal in overtime. And listen, winners win. Texas found a way to win. A big part of that was their defense only giving up 43 yards on the ground. I think that's a fantastic effort. Their defensive line was wreaking havoc all day. But this is a trend that's really concerning to me. As they close out their schedule, I'm really worried about the Longhorns and, you know, We talked about it in our power rankings breakdown. It's why I have Alabama ahead of Texas right now, even though they lost head to head. Yeah. And I think the thing you have to look at with Texas is obviously this would be a different team if Quinn Ewers is at the helm, but he's not like, would it? Well, it would, they looked better to start the season and he was running the offense more efficiently than Malik was. The problem is Malik Murphy is just, he's, he's growing up before our eyes, right? Nobody really, is threatened by him. So you can kind of sell out to stop the run a little bit better. And, and then, you know, the numbers come down a little bit. They still got what they wanted to in the rush game. They, you know, they, they had, who is it? Brooks had 112 and Baxter had 90. They both had, Baxter had 10 yards of carry. It was, he was, he looked healthy yeah. and he looked really dangerous. And a lot of it was the 54 yard score, right? Like that's a big chunk, but like chunks happen. So like, you gotta, you gotta put those in the stat. So, but, but the thing is you don't necessarily get afraid of Malik Murphy the same way you do with Quinn Ewers. And this is the big thing that we hear a lot from Texas fans as well. If this quarterback had been healthy, then da 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 da. Well, he's not. And you got to play the games that are on the field. And, and so look, it, it's, it's taking steps in the right direction. I think Malik looked better this week than he did last week, but it was up and down. It was inconsistent, right? It, it wasn't a consistent game from him into the game. He, he had completed 51% of his passes through two picks. And so, you know, that's not a great effort, but, you know, he kept him in it. He he kept him trying to, he kept trying to fight back. Really have to give credit to Will Howard for willing his team, no pun intended, back into this game. And, and just, I mean, leading a furious comeback effort that uh, I, I still don't know why they didn't just kick that field goal. Maybe it was just low confidence in the kicker, but 
you know, at the end of the day, you know, you have to give Texas the credit for winning, but this does probably shake your confidence about their ability to go ahead and win the conference or make the playoff in that order. Obviously you'd have to win your conference before you make the playoff. This was their last major hurdle before the conference championship game. I'm worried about, you know, how does Malik handle a better defense? If he's still the starting quarterback when they play Iowa state in a couple of weeks, Iowa state's a fantastic defense and could cause a lot of problems for him. How do they, how do they handle an offense like Oklahoma state? That's not going to, you know, fall asleep for the first three quarters and then finally wake up in the fourth with Holly Gordon, right? Well, and, and so, we saw how dominant Oklahoma State looked up front and, and the defensive side of the ball, too. They were given, you know, Dylan Gabriel problems. That's going to be the same thing if they're playing Texas, right? They're going to give Malik Murphy issues. They're going to get to him and they're going to be coming for the ball. They're going to be coming to try to strip sack and, and cause turnovers. And if you're Malik Murphy, you have to work on that and improve your game. I feel bad for him because he got thrust into this situation all of a sudden, but you're the backup of Texas. You got to be ready to go. And, you know, I, I I hear what you're saying about, you know, it would be different with Quinn. I'm not convinced because Quinn was prone to one or two plays like that a game too. It didn't always look as bad as some of what Murphy, you know, did yesterday. Murphy's interceptions were really bad. Um, just not even close on at least one of them, but, Quinn's prone to that too, man. Like he, he yeah. is not, you know, we, we saw it last year. We talked about it a lot this year. I I'm worried about Texas getting through the rest of their schedule unscathed. This sure. was their last really big test before the conference championship game. And I wonder if a win, you know, let's say they do win out. Let's say they beat Oklahoma state in Arlington. Does a win over Oklahoma state rather than avenging that lost Oklahoma, does that move the needle enough to jump them over a one loss Oregon or an undefeated Washington or someone that, you know, is ahead of them in the pecking order right now? Obviously specifics will matter at the time, but I have a really hard time seeing how they're going to keep a one loss Texas. If that one loss or those victories are of any variety, um, I, I guess a one loss conference champion, Texas, especially, out of the playoff. I, I just don't see how it happens. I don't think Oregon gets the benefit of the doubt. I don't think, you know, Bama gets the benefit of the doubt any more than Texas does in this situation, strictly for ratings. And, and I'm, I'm just going to be honest, like, obviously it's a product that's for the TV. Texas will sell tickets. Texas will sell eyeballs. Texas will sell, you know, ad spots on the TVs. If you get to go Texas, Georgia or, or Texas, Florida state, or, you know, Texas, Michigan, or any of those matchups, those are going to sell better than, you know, throwing in the one loss Oregon Ducks or the, the you know, the, you know, I, I don't even know who else you'd be talking about in that situation. But I just think that Texas would be able to make it. I don't think they'd be able to do that much if they can't get Quinn back. Because my only thing with Quinn is, look, Quinn, he has the propensity to make stupid decisions, right? He makes dumb decisions, and, and, and then he, you know, throws a pick that has Texas fans ripping their hair out. But when he's on, he is so good. He is so good when he's on. He he doesn't miss passes. He can bring you all the way back. And that makes the defense from that point until he goes cold again, it makes the defense approach the game differently, right? It means that you're going to have the defense scrambling. You're going to get a lot more out of Brooks and Baxter and, and those boys on the ground in addition to what he gives you in the pass game. He, he's just such a weapon and a threat when he's playing well that I think that you have to respect that a little bit more which just isn't something that Malik Murphy brings. And that's nothing on Malik Murphy. He's a great quarterback and he'll develop, but he's not where Quinn is right now. And so if you're me and you're saying like, oh, well, if I'm a Texas fan, um, what do I would rather want by the end of the season? You're obviously going to want Quinn in there if you have to play Oklahoma State, because even though he might throw the ball directly at Oklahoma State a couple times, he'll will you back into this game. He, he will, you know, force your team to come back and, and to make this game competitive again. He's shown it. He can do it against, you know, Oklahoma, bringing them back to that game. I, I think he could do it against anybody in the conference, at least. It'll be fascinating to watch. It'll be fascinating to see how the committee handles, you know, beating the likes of TCU, Iowa State, Texas Tech. If that, that moves the needle over Oregon, you know, beating – USC, Oregon State, and maybe Washington uh, to avenge that loss. So it'll be it'll be fascinating to see. I'm really interested to see how it plays out. I love that we're getting more teams involved in this discussion, even though if it is a rival. 
for my team. So let's go to the new home, uh, the future home of both of the two teams that we've talked about uh, in the past two segments, Texas and Oklahoma. Let's go to the SEC where the battle for the West was won by the Alabama Crimson Tide. They are now one win away from essentially clinching the SEC West and setting up a date with likely Georgia in Atlanta. And just like all the old Alabama LSU games, this one was a shootout from the start till about the end of the third quarter. Gone are the days of nine to six, Garrett. Um, this is, you know, the new normal for LSU and Alabama. And it was a really fun back and forth between Jalen Milrow and Jaden Daniels, two quarterbacks that are growing up before our eyes. Jaden Daniels, obviously, a little bit further ahead of where Milrow was, but man, I don't know how you can't walk away from this game impressed with how far Jalen Milrow has come this season, how far he's come since that debacle against the Longhorns, since that you know disappearing act against USF the following week. I'm impressed by that, but I want to start, you know, this was a fun back and forth game until Dallas Turner hit Jalen Daniels or Jaden Daniels, excuse me. And, you know, that, that hit was called for roughing the passer. It was reviewed for targeting. It was not called targeting. That's a hit. I I've seen a lot of people talking online about how that was a dirty hit, a cheap shot. I really don't think it was. I think that's a hit that's celebrated about 10 to 15 years ago in college football. And it makes a highlight reel for Alabama's, you know, hype video to get into the stadium uh, next year, about 10 to 15 years ago. It, those happen. Those happen five times in a game where it's just a big hit. This one happened to be roughing the passer. Don't think it was a cheap shot, but it did knock Daniels out of the game. LSU tried to put him back in. I think that was pretty irresponsible. I thought it was pretty obvious that he was, you know, struggling. I don't want to say for sure he had a concussion at that point. I haven't read the you know, diagnosis or anything. He definitely doctor. got his bell rung. He he wasn't at he the wasn't very least, at the very least. And I don't think it was necessarily responsible to throw him back in there, but not going to go too deep into that. But it was a fun shootout until that moment. And after that, that was a big stop. You know, regardless of how it happened, it was a big stop that Alabama got on that drive. And they just, the defense just never really looked back. They figured out a way to stop that LSU offense. Jalen Milrow growing up right before our eyes, played his best game as a member of the Alabama Crimson Tide. And like we kind of highlighted on the previous show, it kind of came down to which defense was going to get more stops. And that was the Alabama defense. Alabama stepped up. LSU showed more cracks like we've seen all year. And that's why Alabama has the inside track to get back to Atlanta as we move forward in the season. Yeah, just to kind of go off of that hit one more time, I don't have a problem with the hit necessarily. Yeah, it's a tough play, and maybe in today's day and age, you got to call something like that. But I think you're right. I think that's just a good football play where you you got a guy coming in there to, you know, you're playing in a heated rivalry game. This is their best player. You're not going to go in and think, oh, how do I just nicely tackle him, you know, with good form and everything. You're you're trying to go in and make a statement. You're trying to make him regret his decisions, which, you know, obviously you're trying to not go in there and hurt anybody, but this this isn't, this isn't just an easy, soft game, right? You're trying to go in there and make a statement. And when the emotions are running that high, you want every play to be big. I honestly thought there were a couple hits earlier in that game that Daniels took that were a lot tougher and a lot meaner than what he got on that play. Yeah, it looked like he wasn't okay, and I don't think he should have played after that point. But, you know, that, that's not for me to say. That's for, I don't know, Brian Kelly and whatever his staff is, you know, and they, they got to figure that out. Um, Brian but Kelly the story, the expert. Yeah, no, he he, you know, he cares. <laughs> he, he wants to make sure everything goes. With he would never put anybody board. in danger for his own benefit. No, never. of course not. No, what are you even talking about? I don't know what you mean. Um, but no, this story is all about Milrow. Look, Milrow wasn't a prolific passer last night, but he didn't have to be. He was a dominant runner. He ran the ball twenty times, one hundred fifty-five yards, four touchdowns on the ground. This is just him wanting it more than anybody else on the field last night, and I think you have to give him major props for that. And that's why I think we have Alabama. I mean, look, they got the outside shot at a playoff now. Um, you know, if they end up winning the conference, even with the one loss. They control I think their own destiny, right? Yeah. Like, if they went out there in the playoff, easily. Yeah, if they go and beat Georgia in the SEC championship game, their one loss is to a very good Texas team early in the season before any of your guys develop. And and you can clearly say that Milrow looks better now. And, oh, they found which guys they wanted to be their role players and which guys are their receivers and which guys are their running backs. 
th- then you can easily make the case for Alabama making the playoff. Obviously, they got to win out. I don't really think that they have what it takes to beat Georgia right now. I think Georgia's just on a different level dominant. Um, but, I mean, look, if, if Milrow puts on a performance like that, uh, I'll take Alabama to beat just about anyone in the country because if Milrow's playing at that level of dominance with that amount of want to, uh, they can win a shootout with anybody. That was one of the things we talked about in the in the pre-show was that they don't want to turn this into a shootout with LSU. Well, it turns out Milrow wanted to turn this into a shootout. He was like, nah, get, give me the rock. I'll take it. This is mine. And so shout out to him. Um, massive play. Now, for everyone saying this is a Milrow Heisman moment, I think that's premature. Um, I, I think there have been much better players, including Jaden Daniels, that are more deserving of the Heisman at this point in the season. But I, I'm not going to say never in this one. He could put together a late season type of run and, you know, weirder things happen than the Alabama quarterback winning the Heisman Trophy. So, um, you know, I, it's a great performance for him, nevertheless. And, and I think you got to be real excited about where your season is if you're an Alabama football fan. Biggest stat to me was that third down that you see on the screen right there, 11 of 14. LSU just could not get Alabama off. That's the just field. scheme win. And they, it, well, it was scheme and it was Jalen Milrow and company just not willing to be denied a lot of times, right? Like, how many times did he take off running and just will himself to a first down? That's because he knows he can because he knows that the spies aren't going to be able to do their job and they're not playing good enough defense to to stop him from picking it up when he needs it. Absolutely. And, you know, it it was scheme, it was talent, and just it was third and whatever. You felt confident that Alabama was going to pick it up on Saturday night. So big, big stat right there. That swung the game and ultimately is what helped Alabama wear down LSU. I I will say for as crazy as this game was and as many points were scored, it's crazy to me that there were no points scored after the 13-01 mark of the fourth quarter. Yeah. yeah. This game was was basically silent for a whole quarter of football after, I mean, multiple scores all night long. And I think that a lot of that had to do with the Daniels situation, right? Sure, like that's, sure. that's certainly why LSU started to shut down a little bit. And Alabama kind of did does what Alabama tends to do. Like Nick Saban is very good at reading the room and knowing, you know, risk risk management is his forte in, in situations like that. What do I need to do to just take the air out of the ball, get out of here with the W? I don't have anything to prove I'm Nick Saban. So, you know, that was another big elements of that as well. But again, 42, 28 Alabama over LSU inside track to Atlanta for the Crimson Tide. Garrett, let's move over to the PAC 12 because there were a couple big matchups there. We'll go through the rest of the scores in that conference here. Let's start with Washington and USC. We talked about Alex Grinch getting fired off the top. The reason, you know, the latest reason, I guess, giving up 52 at home to the Washington Huskies. I know that's an elite offense. I know, that, you know, they're putting up a ton of points on pretty much everybody, but 52-42 at home. Your quarterback, your Heisman winning quarterback, just balls out, runs over to his family in tears at the end of the game because he poured everything out for this victory. And he comes up short because your defense can't stop a nosebleed. And it's been much maligned. We've talked about it a ton. We don't need to beat a dead horse, but it's what's going to hold Lincoln Riley back from ever winning a national championship. He doesn't figure out how to field the defense. He's never going to win the big one. He might not get out of the conference now that he's going to be moving to the big 10. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's the sad part for USC, but I'm going to go ahead and highlight again, the winner here, Washington. Yeah. Fantastic job scoring 52. We've been a little bit harsh on Washington and they hadn't looked nearly as good as you'd expect them to coming off that one against Oregon, but put together a good effort, scored 52. It's a good day at the office for the Washington Huskies. Yeah. Um, and, you know, tons of stars to highlight. Uh, the, uh, the 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 running back, whose name's escaped me right now. I think you have the stat page pulled up, Garrett. Uh, running for over 200 yards. Um, they, they took what USC was going to give them on the offense. Like Mick, Michael Penix Jr. was Michael Penix Jr. He looked fantastic. He looked like he was back to his Heisman favorite self, but you know, they read the scouting report and the scouting report said you can run right up the middle on USC all day long. And they took it to the tune of nine or 10 yards per carry every single time. And it's hard to, that that's demoralizing, right? Like that, that is absolutely 
demoralizing for a defense and for an offense that knows as soon as they get off the field that they're just going to be playing catch up the entire time. Also wanted to shout out, you know, it was not a defensive struggle by any means, but Washington's defense did make more plays than USC. And in the end, you know, when you're talking about a shootout situation, that's really huge. Yeah. And you need to play good situational defense. Um, the running back you're looking for there, Dylan Johnson, uh, yeah. 26 carries, 256 on the ground, four touchdowns, averaging 9.8 on the ground. Not a bad day for the kid. Uh, and really not any outstanding passing numbers, which you'd expect to see in a 52-score game. Uh, their leading receiver was Adunze with 82. So just kind of crazy that there weren't any like standouts in the wide receiver room. But yeah, you're right. They just they knew that they could run the football and that they'd have no issues running the football. And they've seen other people carve it up because they watch film, unlike the formerly employed Alex Grinch. And they, you know, they they did their job. They did what they needed to do, and they did a really good job uh, coming in with a good game plan and just imposing their will. So shout out the Huskies, and uh, you know, maybe this helps them get the ball rolling on offense again, so they can, you know, start to pick it up a little bit and and finish this season nice and strong. Yeah, and you know. We talk about, we keep talking about they're setting up the date with Oregon. They still have a couple uh, hurdles to clear before that, but it does looking like that's what is going to uh, happen as we move to conference championship week. Elsewhere in the conference, Arizona, bowl eligible Jed Fish stand up 27 to 10 win over number 19 UCLA. Garrett, we talked about it off the top. Let's ask it again. Who wins more games this year, Arizona or USC? Uh, I'm going to go with Arizona right now. I know that might be a hot take, but I think Arizona can win more games on the last part of this uh, last part of this little season here. So Arizona, uh, their schedule out is at Colorado versus Utah and at Arizona State. Um, I think two of those are probably gimmies for them. Um, this is a team that has basically found their identity passing the football. Um, and they know what they want to do. They can run the football as well. They're not, you know, ineffective at running the football, but this is a good passing team. A couple of studs, uh, wide receivers. I want to shout them out real quick. Jacob Cowling, uh, Montana Lamonius Craig, uh, Tetro McMillan, just a couple of studs. Wanted to, you know, give them shouts out. Uh, the end of the all scored touchdowns in this game. So um, big for them. And then USC uh, wanting to pull up their schedule uh, on the it's way out. Oregon and UCLA at home. That's so yeah, like it's. I, I don't think that they win either of those games. I'm gonna be honest. I, I don't see how you can. See, I think I hate to say this. I think we're gonna see a one, two, three Cancun situation next week at Autzen. I, I really don't think USC is gonna be. I know they're still alive for the Pac 12 championship. I know that means a lot to them. Like I said off the top, they have a lot to figure out, but. <sighs> it's hard to see them being super motivated for well, that. Game. I'm sure that we're going to break this down in the preview, but this is an extremely motivated Oregon team. This mm -hmm. is a team that got punched in the face, got a little bit of blood in their mouth. And since that Washington loss has looked really, really good. And, and you know, we put them, you know, number five on our you know rankings, but look, this Oregon team is, is really solid plays, really good defense. They're effective on offense. They're, they're you know, dynamic they can really run the football bucky irving having a great season um and, and just look this is a great oregon team that i think is gonna i think they're gonna take it to usc uh, a not very motivated usc and then they get the crosstown rivals in ucla trying to finish their season strong i i think they're gonna go over on the way out i think you know arizona could finish you know eight and four nine and three on a really good high for the season and let's talk about how awesome that would be just to watch a let's go to the extreme they beat utah they beat the other two nine and three Arizona. That's a dream that I would want that to happen. Now this is a strong Arizona team about to join the big 12. So, you know, shout out to them. Yeah. Um, it's, it's great for Arizona. Love the storylines, love all the, the program success for jet fish and company. That's, that's awesome for them. Elsewhere in the pack 12, you mentioned Garrett, Oregon 63, Cal 19, just over from the jump there. Uh, Utah. 55 to three over Arizona state, a fantastic offensive output for the Utes. The pig farmer was back in full form uh, for Utah, Oregon state, 26, Colorado, 19, Colorado loses another heartbreaking one possession game. 
And the surprising score of the week, man, what has happened to Wazoo? They have just completely fallen off here recently. 10-7, to 7, losing at home to Stanford. I'll let you kind of take the take it whatever direction you want there. Uh, look, in terms of Washington State, I have no idea what you can even say um, because I'm, I'm looking at some of the stats. Stanford's quarterback, Ashton Daniels, completes 48% of his passes for 115 yards and one interception. Um, Stanford's leading rusher had 54 yards on the ground. How many turnovers did Washington State have? Um, let me pull that real quick. Uh, total turnovers were one. Really? And Sanford turned the ball over as well, so dead even. Uh, penalties, five for both teams. This Man, is just I'm, I'm gonna have to go back point. and find film of that. I, I gotta go back. I, why would you want to? That's torture. I don't know. Well. I'm a sick um, man. I, I, I and I, I love Washington so. State. I need to know why they're allowing this to happen. Yeah, just home. just they lost when they gave up 217 total yards to Stanford. Amazing. Um, there, there's just no reason for it. And it's just a couple of, I think, kind of bad teams. And one of them is going to move on to the ACC, and one of them is Washington State. Fascinating. Fascinating yep. stuff here. Uh, next week in the Pac-12, we've got a couple big ones. Utah and Washington, um, the aforementioned USC and Oregon, and you know a couple other matches with Arizona and Colorado. I think it's going to be really interesting as well to see how that can play out. Let's move on to uh, the SEC, the remaining games in the SEC, because we did have a couple of big ones there that I want to mention off the top. Georgia 30, Mizzou 21, a game that was even closer than that. Some of the post-game win expectancy models show that Mizzou should have had a 56% chance of winning that game, with all things considered. But really, this was the Carson Beck show. This was the, um, you know, Situation where he's just getting better and better as the season goes along, and he's quietly been one of the most consistent quarterbacks in the country. And Georgia just ultimately, you know, was that much better. Just I, I think some have put it, you know, just inches better than Mizzou. And they 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 have the more talented team. Mizzou is still building, and they're building something special there. I think, but Georgia just the more talented team at this point. Yeah, and, and look, this is an awesome effort from Missouri. If you look at some of these stats, it doesn't really make sense. Missouri outrushed Georgia. Mm -hmm. They they outrushed them by 20 yards. Um, the total yardage was really close. They only failed to meet their total yards by like 22. Um, they did have the one turnover. There were some more penalties. But, man, just a, a tough outcome for Missouri when you really feel like you're in that game. Carson Beck's really been impressive the last you know several weeks. He's been really effective. Not necessarily super dynamic, but very effective. Um, the one turnover I do want to highlight that was kind of an ugly interception where the, you know, I, I think it was um, it was Brady Cook. He just kind of floated it, and then a D lineman caught that thing and took it down the sideline. And he had one of the funniest like interviews about that that I've ever seen, where he was talking about you know how he got kind of harassed on the sideline for not running that fast. He says, "Hey man, you try to keep your knees high, but then you got all this meat in the way." He's talking about his stomach and his belly and everything being in the way as he's trying to run that thing. And he's like, I got my chest high. I got my belly high. I couldn't. I don't know. I just thought that was kind of funny and a, and a nice way to talk about a big man interception return type of thing. His first interception apparently ever that he's ever had in a game since he was like six. So shout out to him. I can't remember his name right now, but good job. Um, love that from you. I'm going to try to see if I can find his um, his stat right here. One interception. I can't find it. Anyways, cool day. Loved it. Nice time. And, and, and you know, hopefully, hopefully a, a continuation of good play for Missouri on the way out. Still a great season for Missouri. Um, and, and obviously Georgia's rolling right now. But Missouri, you still have lots to play for. And I think they're going to have a great season on the way out. A couple of big games for both of those teams next week as Mizzou hosts Tennessee. Georgia hosts a top 10 Ole Miss. Speaking of Ole Miss, they escape. A home game against Texas A&M, man, nine home losses in a row for Texas A&M dating back to 2021. 38-35 Ole Miss wins this one. A&M's field goal attempt to, to, to tie and send it to overtime came up short. Um, what else can we say at this point? I don't think we need to spend another, you know, 20 minutes berating Jimbo Fisher like we have in the past, but this was a classic Jimbo Fisher game. Come out flat, you know, come up just short and you're going to blame it on execution or not finding the inches, I guess. But, you know, Ole Miss, another big win at home. 
Uh, I hate to say it, Lane Kiffin, you know, we know that he loves trolling Texas A&M for some reason. Uh, he loves trolling Jimbo Fisher for some reason. And he got another win against them today. So hats off to him. Quinshawn Judkins with a big day. And again, big date with Georgia next week. Yeah, that was kind of the big thing, too, is Quinshawn having such a big game against an Aggie defense, which is normally pretty good at stopping the run. But Quinshawn went for over 100 and three touchdowns. So um, got to give it to him. That's a that's a heck of a player. And sometimes you're just going to get yours. Um, but look, at the end of the day, again, it's just a and failure. And, and I kind of want to know what's more impressive to you, that Jimbo's lost nine in a row on the road or that our Texas Rangers won 11 and 0 on the road in the postseason. I don't know which it's is more way impressive. more impressive to win 11 in a row on the road. Absolutely. But, I mean, it is pretty impressive to be that bad on the road, but obviously, yeah, it's, it's listen, better in the postseason. Listen, it, it's Jimbo, just it's it's a tough scene. Jimbo's lost control of the program. I'm on the fire Jimbo train, and there's not really a whole lot more to say about this situation. It's tough to watch. Max Johnson throws an interception in the end zone that you should never throw. Um, and that kind of comes out to be the game because if you kick a field goal on that drive, that's your difference. So, yep. Anyways, just got to execute, man. Just got to execute. I hate and it. Find the inches. Corey Seeger, Adolis Garcia, Nathan Avaldi, and company have made me not care as much. And that's a fantastic place <laughs> to be. Shout out to them. Um, elsewhere in the SEC, Arkansas 39 36 over Florida in the swamp and overtime. I think a big win for the Hogs as they try to desperately grasp for their remaining hopes of bowl eligibility. Big loss for Billy Napier and the Gators as they are, you know, definitely reeling. I think they've maybe, I think if they're honest with themselves, they probably let Georgia beat them twice there. Kentucky 24 to 3 over Mississippi State. Mississippi State's one scoring drive in this game was like 20 plays, nine minutes to kick a field goal. So, I think it was like 12 minutes, too. Yeah. It, yeah, it, was, stupid. it, it was like a Dennis Franchoni option left, option right type of drive. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We we're just – a &M fans are never going to listen to this podcast With again. the deep cuts? Um, 24-3 <laughs> Kentucky wins. Auburn 31-15 to over Vandy, and then a couple non-con games. Tennessee just – Destroys UConn 59 to 3 and South Carolina wins the cockfight 38 28 over. Not convincing, but at least they get back in the win column. Listen, it was a back and forth battle between those two, but uh, yeah, South Carolina back in the win column. This game was That's tied all. at the end of three quarters. You don't have to remind South Carolina fans. That's of all that I'm going to say. If they haven't already checked out from this season, they are uh, well aware of that fact. But Sorry about the Gamecocks. Um, well, of the Gamecocks. Yeah. Absolutely. And Jacksonville State, I mean, I'm still on the let them play uh, James Madison in the yeah, who cares. Why not? Yeah, bowl. Just play the game. Play the game. Exactly. Especially if we don't have enough teams to fill spots, which is looking more and more likely. Um, Georgia can clinch the East with a win next week against Ole Miss. Bama would ultimate uh, be a virtual lock if they can beat Kentucky um, and definitely be a lock if uh, Ole Miss loses as well. Let's go over to the Big Ten here. A couple of interesting results. Ohio State was losing to Rutgers at halftime, 9-7. to seven. Number one, Ohio State, we should say, on the college football playoff rankings. Um, Rutgers had a chance to score a touchdown and be up 16-7 to seven, um, at, the end, at the beginning of the third quarter, but instead throws a pick six in the red, in the red zone, in Ohio State's red zone. And the rest was history for Ohio State. They kind of took that momentum from that. But, you know, a sleepy morning in Piscataway, another lackluster offensive performance from the Buckeyes. Uh, do you think they fall out of number one this week in the college football playoff? Right? I think I know it's a TV sure. show, I but. I don't know that they're going to. They're going to look at this and say, what do you mean? They beat Rutgers by, what is it, 19 points? That's dominant. That's a really good Rutgers team. And so, look, and Marvin Harrison looked good in this game, had another good one for him. Um, and, and obviously, this team shows up to play. This is a very good Ohio State team. Um, but look, it, it's, it's, this was the Travion Henderson show. They took the ball out of McCord's hands for the majority of this game. Um, and they put this ball on the ground and they, they won that way. Um, so even if, you know, Harrison's going to have those, you know, highlight type touchdown catches on the goal line. That this is still a team that I don't know that you can trust to come up with the big plays long term. They've had some ups and downs. Um, I wasn't necessarily convinced they looked that good against Wisconsin. 
Um, I know that it's tough to play Camp Randall, but does that and now they survive at Rutgers? Look, it's it's this isn't a bad Ohio State team. I still think they deserve to be in the playoff talk, and they should be in the playoff. But I don't think that they're number one, and I don't think they should be treated as number one. Um, it won't matter because at the end of the day, I think you're going to find yourself to Ohio State and Michigan are going to play at the end of the year, and the winner of that's going to be your number one seed. I think that's just going to be how it goes. And that's kind of fun, too. It's kind of fun to have a game that matters like that, where at the very end of the year, one of those two teams is going to be number one, and the other one's probably going to be number four. Yeah, and I I would push back that the other one's going to be number four. I think this year there's enough contenders to push them out. It, it, it obviously depends on how everything else Yeah, it depends out. on the Pac-12, yeah. I think, the most. You have to get a one-loss Pac-12 champ. Can't have yep. another Utah winning it with three losses or something. <laughs> right, absolutely. Speaking yeah. of Michigan, they took out a lot of frustrations on the Purdue Boilermakers, 41-13. to 13. Penn State, sorry, Garrett, 51-15 to 15 over the Maryland Terrapins. Uh, Michigan and Penn State, big showdown this week in Happy Valley. We'll see if Penn State can finally win the big one there. Maybe the most surprising results of the weekend. Uh, you know, actually, you know, the rest of these are actually pretty surprising other than Iowa beating Northwestern 10 to seven. I think everyone saw something. Nobody's like that shocked that that game went under. We're just kind of shocked that it went under 20. I think. <sighs> Listen, you asked if they could get an over under in the teens by the end of the year. It might depend on their bowl matchup, but Iowa Rutgers yeah, next week might, Iowa Rutgers might come close. Um, Vegas can't keep losing money like this. It's no, everyone. there's no Smartly way. Smartly betting the under on Iowa. Um, but three, I would call upsets in, uh, throughout the rest of the conference here, I, Indiana 20 to 14 over Wisconsin, certainly an upset Michigan state gets their first big 10 win of the year, 20 to 17 over Nebraska, who was fighting for bowl eligibility and Illinois stuns Minnesota 27 to 26. If you're looking for a standings update here, it's kind of the same old story, right? Michigan state and Ohio, or sorry, not Michigan state, Michigan and Ohio State kind of control their own destiny in the East, and the Shadow Realm is Shadow Realming out West. So, um, yeah, a lot of teams are just fighting for the right to lose by 60 on Conference Championship Weekend uh, to whoever. Yeah. And we had to give it time, but the Shadow Realm is starting to Shadow Realm, and I knew that it would. We just had to have faith that it would get there, and, and that's nice. Crazy thing about this one is Nebraska loses to Michigan State on a day when Michigan State rushed for 63 yards. Yeah, I don't know. That, just, that seems nuts to me. You shouldn't be able to run for 63 yards and beat a team. Sometimes a team is just due for a win, and it's just going to happen. Uh, and, uh, right? To be fair, Nebraska did have three turnovers, so that's part of yeah. it. But, you know, Nebraska's neither here nor there. Nebraska's offense is still very much under construction. If they win, they, I, th I still think they can find a way to get to a bowl game. They just need one more win. But, um, yeah, it, it's not pretty on the offensive side of the ball anywhere in the Big Ten West. Uh, let's go to the Big 12. Kansas backs up, avoids the Oklahoma hangover, wins against rival Iowa State 28-21, a game that Iowa State was favored in by three points in Ames. Kansas one game back in the big 12 standings can definitely, you know, uh, find a way to make something happen down the stretch. West Virginia, Neil Brown is a bowl eligible Garrett 37 to seven over BYU. Neil Brown. Syndrome That's the bowl dumbest Virginia. result of the year. West Virginia shouldn't be bowl eligible, but congrats. I mean, you know, I guess I'm happy for you. And they're going to keep Neil Brown. They're going to have to keep Neil Brown and find to. out what to do with him. Maybe That's he's going to corner funny result. Maybe he's turned a corner, but, you know, I think long term that might not be the best decision for the Mountaineers. We'll see. Uh, Houston, like we mentioned, with Oklahoma State beat Baylor 25-24 in overtime. UCF gets their first Big 12 win, albeit against a fellow newcomer uh, in Cincinnati 28-26. And back on Thursday night, Texas Tech got off the schneid and beats TCU at home. I remember, I'm old enough to remember in previous season when I had this one circled as a championship elimination game. And it definitely wasn't that, but it might have been a bowl eligibility elimination game here as Tech uh, knocks off the Horn Frogs 35 28. And uh, I had to uh, help a frog across my parking lot earlier. And I, that just felt like a microcosm of where TCU is at right now. That's, they need that's really true. 
they need someone to get them out of the parking lot and into the into the grass uh into the off season so they can recruit um after everything that yeah. they've been through this year. They they took a lot of emotional baggage from that last playoff run and they're just gonna have to kind of wait around for a minute, maybe regroup at the end of the season, see what they gotta do. And listen, this is why we tell people don't overreact to one year with a coach that hasn't consistently shown you that he can do it. Not saying yeah. Sonny Dykes is not going to be a good coach at TCU. I'm just saying. Uh, Baylor's, probably, Baylor's probably thinking the same thing about Dave Aranda right now. <laughs> um, in the ACC, uh, I'll do a quick standings update actually in the Big 12. Texas and Oklahoma State at the top. They would be playing against each other if the season ended today. Five teams are sitting one game back, though, so it's going to be fascinating to see how that plays out here throughout the rest of November. Over in the ACC, um, shout out the kid from uh, Spartanburg, right? As Clemson, 31, Notre Dame, 23. Sure, sure. Uh, Why not? Why not? No Will Shipley, no problem for the Clemson Tigers as, you know, Dabo gets his revenge game. It's not going to matter in the grand scheme of things in college football this year. Notre Dame was well out of the college football playoff race. Clemson will make a bowl game, I think, now, but, you know, good for them. I think there's still deep, deep deep-rooted cracks in that Clemson program that may or may not be addressed this offseason, but good for them for this week. Well, and it probably gets their game against Georgia Tech off of, like, the CW for next week, so that's nice. Um, that's you, good. Know, you don't want to play on the CW if you're a premier brand. That's not especially if you're playing Georgia Tech. That's that's a dangerous right. place to be. You don't want to be, you know, in the darkness where Georgia Tech operates and you know takes their victims. So, you, you know, don't I, I, be I, favorite on the CW. I'm no. pretty sure every week the no 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 covered. Uh, and why are we suggesting that Georgia Tech won't be the favorite in that game? No, but shout out to Clemson. I do want to say Phil Moffa, 186 yards, two touchdowns on 36 carries. Just a workhorse. You don't really see that anymore in college football. So shout out to him. Yeah, great, great performance from him. Uh, Florida State takes care of business against Pitt, 24 to seven. A little bit of an ugly win, but they, you know, never were out of control in that one. Speaking of not being out of control, Louisville, 34 to three over Virginia Tech. Talk to your kids about 11 and 1 Louisville. I'm here to tell you right now, it's looking more and more likely every day. Garrett Mitch's darling, Georgia Tech, 45 to 7 over Virginia. Rambling wreck, right? Rambling right along into bowl eligibility, possibly here. Uh, tough close. I think they can get it done. They need to beat Syracuse uh, to make sure that they get in there. And just because I'm going to continue the theme of finding ways to make all of our A&M fans mad, Haynes King looked really, really good in that game. 208 passing, but 76% completions, and he ran for 83. This is the kind of performance I think most of them were expecting uh, when he was in A&M, but now he's at Georgia Tech getting it done. Um, And, and, you know, this is going to be a fun close this season. They also had several other rushers. Jamal Haynes had 119. Dante Smith had 78. Uh, Evan Dickens at 15. Zach Pyron obviously came in late. He had 10. So shout out to Georgia Tech running the football again, being pretty dominant in the run game. And like I said, that game against Clemson, that's about to be a fun one. Well, Miami is broken, broken. Uh, oh, NC seriously. State. Uh, NC State takes that one over the Hurricanes. Duke bounces back really nicely, 24-21 over Wake Forest. I think they were down 21-7 to or something like that in this game. They were down pretty big uh, without Garrett Riley, and they come back and win against Wake Forest. Syracuse, right, Riley Leonard. Leonard. Riley, thank you, Riley right. Leonard. Uh, Garrett Riley. Obviously. Yeah, Garrett Riley was not there either, but yeah. Uh, Garrett Riley was not at Duke either, that's right. Um, yeah. But uh, Riley Leonard uh, was out for Duke, and they still were able to beat Wake Forest. Syracuse is still not good. 17 to 10 losers against Boston College. Boston College is going to a bowl game, though. So that's the real headline there. Let's go. And North Carolina does what they do against the Campbell Fighting Camels, uh, 59 to 7. Not much noteworthy there. Um, But noteworthy thing for a second the Campbell Camels do have a lion with home field. So go check that out. There we go. Yeah. That's about all I can say for the Campbell Camels in this spot. 
and who doesn't want a fun shirt with a camel on it? I, I yeah. use code three tech pod, get 15% off on it. Uh, Garrett, let's move over to the G five. Uh, as we round things out here, we say our condolences and we pay our respects to the dream of air force playing in a new year's six bowl army made sure that's not going to happen. Uh, 23 to three over the fly boys. And, uh, listen, they just dominated, right? Army has not looked good at all this year. They lost to Monroe. They lost, you know, they've lost pretty much every game they played against FBS competition. Throw the records out in a rivalry game, though, and throw the records out in the service academies meetup as Army takes that one. And um, dominant the big fashion. one, Air Force, six turnovers in that game. Yes. But I don't six care who you are. You're not going to win a game with six turnovers. Sloppy game from Air Force. Um, they did throw for a hundred yards though, so because <laughs> they had to, they were down they by had to, yeah. point. Um, Fresno and UNLV also won to stay in contention in the Mountain West. That's gonna be a really fun race to watch down the stretch. Unfortunately, looks like it's probably not gonna be for a New Year's six birth at this point. Um, it's looking more and more like that'll go to one of the top three in the American as all three. Of the top three, stay undefeated in conference play. Tulane, uh, all, all three of these were very close wins, one possession. But Tulane's was, Tulane's was a little ugly, 13-10 to 10 over a bad East Carolina team. But when your clunkers survive in advance, UTSA 37-29 to 29 over UNT. UNT just can't find a defense to stop anybody. Real and plug SMU, game with UNT, but they just they can't. Yeah, you're right. They can't stop. Their anything. offense is really fun, and they're going to keep them yeah. in all the games, but their defense is going to make sure they lose a lot of heartbreakers. And SMU continues the DFW dominance over Houston this week, uh, this this month, this season, 36 to 31 over the Rice Owls, another team that just finds, you know, ways to stay plucky and stay in it, but lose heartbreakers. Yeah, no, uh, it's. It's going to be fun to watch the American on the way out. I think that it's going to be a good finish to the season. I think we deserve to lay an SMU. I think that's going to be your best matchup overall. But UTSA, not dead. They could definitely uh, definitely play for this game. So, you know, I'm excited to see how this one finishes out. And, um, yeah, I don't know. There's just not a whole lot more to say there. It's going to be a good close to the season for, I, I think, a pretty solid conference going into playoff expansion. Yeah, absolutely. And you, SMU and UNT played this week. I think they're going to combine for about 90 points. And uh, UTSA and Tulane play on the last week of the regular season. So look out for that one. Liberty, 9-0, and beats Louisiana Tech 56-30. to They make an appearance in our power rankings. They make an appearance in the AP poll at number 25. But will and they make an appearance in the college football playoff poll? Probably not because they have fun whoa. and they should be. If you're nine yeah. and zero, you should be ranked in the college football playoff. Yes, I don't care who you've played, James Madison should be ranked as well. That's a whole nother different situation. <sighs> they also won to prove to nine and zero. Did you see the Virginia Attorney General is uh, looking into lit- uh, if he can sue the NCAA to force them into a bowl game? Look, this is the commitment and the effort that we need. Finally, a politician doing something productive. Yeah, absolutely. He's definitely not just pandering votes. Um, I mean, but, hey, look, uh, that might be his strategy. That's fine. Do your thing. Listen, he knows what the people want. The people, people want, want a James care of Madison in the Cotton Bowl or whatever. Yeah. I don't know what the bowl game is this year, but the, the Fiesta Bowl, something. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, but, yes, they did win to improve to 9-0. and Very impressive win over Georgia State. And Texas State going to their first FBS bowl game ever after they get their sixth win. They beat Georgia Southern 45-24 at home. It was a fantastic scene in San Marcos. The tradition there at graduation is you jump in the San Marcos River. It's a very big part of the culture there. It runs right through the middle of the town. Um, Really fun scene. The university president said he would jump in the river if – they got bowl eligibility. So right after they won Saturday night, he and this whole student section, practically whole football team heads down to the river. He jumps in first and the whole football team jumps in after him. It's a great video. Yeah. Uh, if you yeah. haven't seen it yet, on go, go watch it. It was a lot of fun. And, and that's Tons a good Georgia fun. Southern team that they beat too. That's, that's a really Absolutely. solid squad. So I think that might be able to you know, ruffle some feathers with whatever bowl game they get into. I think they might, you know, they might go snag one too. Let's go bring home some hardware, Texas state. 
not eliminated from uh, the title contention yet either in the Sun Belt. So we'll see how that plays out. I'm happy that someone in my household is bowl eligible because my team, it's November 5th and my team is still not bowl eligible. So hey, it's it's a season long goal, and you just have to be patient because it's if they can get it done over the season, that's what the coach has stated the goal is. AM fans. I'm so sorry. We don't I'm hate so you. I'm so sorry, we are, we are I've got a whole I've got a whole shelf up here with just AM. So I've been I've been suffering just like you have. Okay. This is how we cope, AM fans. And you're welcome to join us anytime. Uh, the group text really was, I was toxic in the group text yesterday. I just kept saying execute and find the inches and love is the reason for the fight and all the other stupid stuff that Jimbo says. It's really fun to cope in this way. And it's more fun when your baseball team wins the World Series. It helps. Way more pain. fun. And it's more fun when Buzz Williams is just one day away and he can hopefully <laughs> bring some Come hardware on. to Aggie Come Lane. On. So on that note, Garrett, it's been a great show. Um, title races are heating up. College football playoff debates are heating up. We're here for only three more weeks of the regular season before conference championship play is here. And we got to savor these moments, man. It's been great talking to you tonight. Guys, make sure that you are checking out everything on the Transfer Portal CFB. Make sure you're following us, subscribing on social media, on YouTube, on your podcast app of choice. And don't forget to check out Home Field Apparel, 3 Tech Pod for 15% off. That man over there, Mr. Garrett Turney for Mitch Mason for his lovely fiance that he is very happy to be with. I'm Trey Reeves, and we'll see you guys next time. Gracious, yeah.